this wonderful work right here, which is on long-term loan to the institution from Brahm and Sandy Dykstra, very good friends of the museum. Um, the work, as I said, is by Charles White, and it is called Soldier from 1944. It's a tempera on panel work. First thing I want to do is just start off with a little bit of biography. This work, again, is from 1944, so let's catch up um, to that point. Charles White is born in Chicago in 1918 to a working class family. His father dies when he's only eight years old. Um, there is another marriage right after that, um, but uh, due to a lot of alcohol abuse, that marriage dissolves very quickly. And he is the only child, so it's just him and his mother. And he starts working uh, basically at age seven, shining shoes, running errands, being a delivery boy, whatever he can do to help his mom out. Um, and she takes him around to her own jobs, sometimes cleaning houses, things like that. And there's a really wonderful anecdote of him uh, as a very young child uh, pulling these uh, drapes off of uh, the windows of one of the houses she's working in so he can stretch them and use them as canvases. Um, so he was a, an ornery little artist um, uh, before he was age 10. Um, she tried to get him to play music, uh, didn't stick at all, he just wanted to be an artist. Um, and he, because his mother was working so much, really took it upon himself to educate uh, himself. This leads to something very interesting. He's a really great student um, all through, uh, let's say, middle school. He gets into high school and starts having some truancy problems. It's not that he's a bad kid at all. In fact, they find that he skips school to go to the public library or to go to the Art Institute of Chicago and walk around the galleries. He is so frustrated um, with his classes. Some of them he thinks are boring, but mostly he's really mad that all of this interesting African-American history he's reading about is nowhere to be found in any of his classes in high school. So he kind of develops uh, this, this real uh, grudge against his teachers. He stops going for a while, and he eventually has to stay in high school a year longer um, just to finish. The thing that gets him to go back to really uh, finish his uh, high school diploma is that he does want to go to the Art Institute of Chicago and he gets a scholarship because he brings his grades up enough to go and in fact there was a two-year program um, and meanwhile during all of this again he's working you know odd jobs on the side anything he can do to help him and his family get by he completes his two-year program at the Art Institute in one year so he is incredibly um, a prodigious young man productive young man um, when he's at the Art Institute, this is a very important moment um, because that is where he finds lithography and he falls in love with printing. Um, it is something that is a lifelong passion for him. He uh, had a 19, uh, 1971 interview um, where they were talking to him about printing and lithography versus painting and he said, if I, you know, basically if I could I'd be printing all the time. But you don't always have access to a press, and as we'll learn, he uh, had some health issues that kept him out of the printing studio for a while as well. But um, looking at this work and thinking about him as a lithographer, um, indeed when you look up his, um, his oeuvre, uh, you'll find just as many prints as you will drawings and paintings. Um, this is, as I said, a tempera on panel. We are looking at a painting, but it has all the sensibilities of a print. Um, you know, obviously when you look at these brush strokes, it very much looks like this could be a lithograph. He's basically drawing with the paint here. These very fine brush strokes built up, layered over top of one another that look like they're done with a colored pencil, basically. Um, he is, this is, as, as I said, a situation where you can really say the artist is drawing with paint. Um, so, uh, as I said, we're trying to catch up here to uh, 1944, and um, he, uh, at, in 1940, joins the Works Progress Administration, starts getting some uh, work as a, a muralist, as a sign painter, and um, uh, when we think about him doing these, these murals, and uh, indeed his uh, biggest one is probably at Hampton University, and that doesn't happen till the end of the 1940s. But when you th we think about him doing this type of work, um, it's important to think about where he's at in our museum. So when we look at this wall here, what do we notice about the works that surround um, this piece by Charles White? What stands out to us? Mm -hmm. 
on either side, two paintings in this direction and two paintings in this direction, you can see the incredible global presence of Mexican muralism, and the influence that movement had on other artists. Um, obviously, Diego Rivera with these two works right here, but you have someone like Jean Charlot um, and David Alfar Alfaro Siqueiros. Um, Jean Charlot, who's technically French, but does spend a lot of time in Mexico and is um, uh, similar to Charles White, learning f directly from and, and influenced by the Mexican muralists. Yes, technically he's French, but I mean, to be honest, uh, Diego Rivera spoke better French than Spanish. So um, what we're really talking about is, as I said, this sort of global uh, influence that Mexican muralism had on artists. Here's Charles White, um, and he's incredibly influenced by the Mexican muralists. He actually goes down um, after the war to Mexico City to uh, a print workshop, a very famous print workshop, uh, Taillet de Grafica. It's um, uh, uh, supposed to be a you know, maybe six month stop for him and it ends up being two years he stays in Mexico City. Um, I, you know, he meets Diego Rivera and, um, s and certainly knows about his work. But more than anything, when you look at this piece, you can see that he's influenced by people like Siqueiros and I think also people like Orozco a lot. And I brought some visual aids to kind of show that off just a little bit, what I mean by that. You know, obviously, um, here, we have, here we have a working class mother. Obviously, as in this work um, by Charles White, and this work, uh, this little printout I, I uh, brought here from Siqueiros, you can see this interest in the geometric form um, and the way that they're representing uh, the figure. You know, I think the, the eyes are always very expressive in both of these um, artists' work. So, you know, you can see that um, here's a, another, you know, the soldiers of Zapata, and this is a later work by Siqueiros, but um, very much indicative of uh, his style throughout his career. And again, you can see just this repetition of form, um, this repeating pattern, these repeating shapes that happen um, and when you look at, when getting back to that idea of this having the sensibility of a print, when you look at this work, you can really see, um, you know, the influence of uh, this graphic style. There's so many hard edges here. Um, it's really a composition that's made up of these repeating shapes over and over. We see it in the shoulder, and that same um, shape, you know, then shows up in the uniform over and over. So there's this patterning, this, this geometric composition that it's built up on. But then, you know, when I look at the background and I look at some of the, the brush strokes in the face, that's where I really see Orozco a lot. Um, I brought in just one uh, work right, right here by Orozco, and um, you can see in his backgrounds that are always very painterly. But when I pass this around, I also want you to look um, at this form right here and just see the types of uh, really painterly brush strokes that are going into the, the composition of this flesh um, that I think you also see echoed somewhat in the face here of Charles White. But that very expressive background, um, I think, absolutely has to do with seeing Orozco. And, you know, I, I don't know how much they actually ever interacted, but certainly by the time Charles White goes to Mexico City, Orozco has um, finished some large murals in the Palacio de Bellas Artes, and he must have seen them while he was there for a couple of years. Um, this style of, of his, an, another Charles White work from the 40s here, this geometric style in the human figure is actually something that softens over time for Charles White, but um, overall remains compositionally important. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a much later work by Charles White, and you see that his um, humans get a lot more naturalistic. But the context, the environment, the backgrounds that they're enveloped by remains very much patterned, um, a, a composition of geometric forms. I brought just um, one more here from his Wanted Poster series, and you see the faces are very soft now, uh, really fading into the background. But again, the overall composition is made up of this geometric patterning. So I will pass these three around as well, so you can kind of see that um, even, f even from this work in 1944, to understand the artist's career, that you know, this love of line and this love of graphic sensibilities continues with him throughout his life. Um, 
1944, again, what's going on in 1944? Why would we have a soldier depicted here? What's going on in, in, in the global arena in 1944? Toward the end of the world. Yes, we're towards the end. This is also the year that Charles White gets drafted into the army. And he um, actually uh, is drafted into the army and they find out how talented of an artist that he is. And so he is assigned to paint camouflage. That is his job for the army. These things that we never think about, right? And I'm sure that's all printed on a computer now and everything, but that was his assignment. Um, and he's actually at a fort in um, Missouri and com becomes very ill. And that's when um, they discover that he's had tuberculosis actually for a long time. And it's interesting because had he not been in the army and, and been around those doctors, who knows what would have happened if they would have caught that in time. Um, but he's seriously ill and in the hospital for a couple years, um, does recover, uh, gets out uh, of the hospital and uh, him and his wife moved to New York City. He gets a one-man show, um, gets sort of recognition going, and that's when he decides to take that trip down to Mexico. Like I said, he stays there for a couple years, um, which he didn't really exactly discuss with his wife ahead of time, I don't think. Um, then he gets a residency at, um, at uh, Hampton, and uh, then he finally makes his way back to New York City. The marriage sort of falls apart, um, but he becomes even bigger in not just um, not just the art world, but the black intellectual world of New York City. I'll tell you just a few other people that lived in the same building as him in New York City when he comes back after being uh, in Mexico City and Washington, D.C. These are people that include Thurgood Marshall, W.E.B. Du Bois, Duke Ellington. So he's around some of the most f incredible political and uh, artistic cultural minds. And he is really motivated um, and, and uh, well, I should say he's really accepted in that scene because coming from Mexico City and seeing these muralists that could take the stuff he was interested in, which was history, um, and, and specifically he wanted to tell African-American history, um, but to see artists who could take that and put it into their artwork on this huge scale was so inspiring for him. And he came back, again, the first thing he did is go to Washington DC and make this big mural. Um, once he comes back from Mexico City, he is so inspired to infuse politics, to infuse important historical statements into his work. And that's something that continues um, until he dies. Just to finish up, uh, Charles White uh, eventually in 1956 uh, picks up with his new wife and they move to California. Um, and he loves it. The latter part of his life, he's not as involved. He had been involved in so many uh, boards and art organizations in New York City and was a part, of, like I said, of the black intellectual community there. The latter part of his life, he's really focusing on his own legacy. Um, he has a quote that he gave, in, uh, again, from this documentary in 1971, and I encourage all of you to look it up. It's just called Five, and it's about five African-American artists. And, um, but one of the quotes he says there, he feels this very strongly, is he, think, is he says, I think a man without a history is nothing. And indeed, in the latter part of his career, it seems like he's focusing on his own legacy and his own history. Um, this is a time when him and his wife, who are older, decide to adopt two children. Um, they move into this fabulous uh, home uh, right uh, there in Los Angeles by Otis College, which is where he ends up teaching. Um, and the son of John Brown is actually laid to rest in uh, his backyard, the plot that he actually has. So he's found this great African-American history in, of all places, Los Angeles. Um, and he loves teaching at Otis. He teaches there from 1965 all the way till he dies in 1979. Um, and uh, again, realize that this is coming uh, in the uh, no, the, the parlance, uh, the, the uh, slang of the 1970s. But his quote about uh, teaching at Otis from this 1971 documentary is, man, I really dig teaching. It's such a great part of my daily existence. I find that the youth of today turn me on. They're thinking, acting, and reacting in a really positive, constructive way. I get up every day and think, what new hope is gonna come into my life today? He loves going to class and talking with youth. And when you watch this documentary, you see that they're talking about art as much as they're talking about race relations, as much as they're talking about history in his class. Um, and he really does uh, end up succeeding in securing his legacy at the end of his career 
as a teacher, as this wonderful um, teacher to future generations of artists that come out of Otis. Um, so a, a wonderful uh, work uh, to have in the museum, uh, nice to have African American artists up on the wall, but also great to see how this work, again by American artists, plays into some of our strengths, um, like having uh, representations of the Mexican muralist movement, and, um, and also, again, uh, like I said uh, to some of you at the beginning, this is um, a condensed version of our uh, modern and contemporary art, so Charles White um, is one of our best of the best to make it into this condensed uh, version of the gallery as well they are undergoing uh, renovation. So that's a little bit about Charles White. Thank you very much for coming.